A Smile of Fortune, Chapter 5 I kept my word to Jacobus. I haunted his home. He was perpetually finding me there of an afternoon when he popped in for a moment from the store. The sound of my voice talking to his Alice greeted him on his doorstep, and when he returned for good in the evening, ten to one he would hear it still going on in the veranda. I just nodded to him. He would sit down heavily and gently and watch with a sort of approving anxiety my efforts to make his daughter smile. I called her often Alice right before him. Sometimes I would address her as Miss Don't Care. And I exhausted myself in nonsensical chatter without succeeding once in taking her out of her peevish and tragic self. There were moments when I felt I must break out and start swearing at her till all was blue, and I fancied that had I done so, Jacobus would not have moved a muscle. A sort of shady, intimate understanding seemed to have been established between us. I must say the girl treated her father exactly in the same way she treated me, and how could it have been otherwise? She treated me as she treated her father. She had never seen a visitor. She did not know how men behaved. I belonged to the low lot with whom her father did business at the port. I was of no account. So was her father. The only decent people in the world were the people of the island, who would have nothing to do with him because of something wicked he had done. This was apparently the explanation Miss Jacobus had given her of the household's isolated position, for she had to be told something, and I feel convinced that this version had been assented to by Jacobus. I must say the old woman was putting it forward with considerable gusto. It was on her lips, the universal explanation, the universal allusion, the universal taunt. One day Jacobus came in early, and beckoning me into the dining room, wiped his brow with a weary gesture and told me that he had managed to unearth a supply of quarter bags. It's fourteen hundred your ship wanted, did you say, Captain? Yes, yes, I replied eagerly, but he remained calm. He looked more tired than I had ever seen him before. Well, Captain, you may go and tell your people that they can get that lot for my brother. As I remained open-mouthed at this, he added his usual placid formula of assurance. You'll find it correct, Captain. You spoke to your brother about it? I was distinctly awed, and for me, because he must have known that my ship's the only one hung up for bags. How on earth? He wiped his brow again. I noticed that he was dressed with unusual care in clothes in which I had never seen him before. He avoided my eye. You've heard people talk, of course. That's true enough. He, we certainly, for several years. His voice declined to a mere sleepy murmur. You see, I had something to tell him of, something which... His murmur stopped. He was not going to tell me what this something was, and I didn't care. Anxious to carry the news to my charterers, I ran back on the veranda to get my hat. At the bustle I made, the girl turned her eyes slowly in my direction, and even the old woman was checked in her knitting. I stopped a moment to exclaim excitedly, your father's a brick, Miss Don't Care. That's what he is. She beheld my elation in scornful surprise. Jacobus, with unwanted familiarity, seized my arm as I flew through the dining room and breathed heavily at me a proposal about a plate of soup that evening. I answered distractedly, Eh? What? Oh, thanks. Certainly. With pleasure. And tore myself away. Dine with him? Of course, the merest gratitude. But some three hours afterwards, in the dusky, silent street paved with cobblestones, I became aware that it was not mere gratitude which was guiding my steps toward the house with the old garden, where for years no guest other than myself had ever dined. 
Mere gratitude does not gnaw at one's interior economy in that particular way. Hunger might, but I was not feeling particularly hungry for Jacobus's food. On that occasion, too, the girl refused to come to the table. My exasperation grew. The old woman cast malicious glances at me. I said suddenly to Jacobus, Here, put some chicken and salad on that plate. He obeyed without raising his eyes. I carried it with a knife and fork and a serviette out on the veranda. The garden was one mass of gloom, like a cemetery of flowers buried in the darkness, and she in the chair seemed to muse mournfully over the extinction of light and color. Only whiffs of heavy scent passed like wandering fragrant souls of that departed multitude of blossoms. I talked volubly, jocularly, persuasively, tenderly. I talked in a subdued tone. To a, a listener, it would have sounded like the murmur of a pleading lover. Whenever I paused expectantly, there was only a deep silence. It was like offering food to a seated statue. I haven't been able to swallow a single morsel thinking of you out here starving yourself in the dark. It's positively cruel to be so obstinate. Think of my sufferings. Don't care. I felt as if I could have done her some violence, shaken her, beaten her maybe. I said, your absurd behavior will prevent me coming here any more. What's that to me? You like it. It's false, she snarled. My hand fell on her shoulder, and if she had flinched, I verily believe I would have shaken her. But there was no movement, and this immobility disarmed my anger. You do, or you wouldn't be found on the veranda every day. Why are you here, then? There are plenty of rooms in the house. You have your own room to stay in, if you did not want to see me. But you do. You know you do. I felt a slight shudder under my hand and released my grip as if frightened by that sign of animation in her body. The scented air of the garden came to us in a warm, wave-like, a voluptuous and perfumed sigh. Go back to them, she whispered, almost pitifully. As I re-entered the dining room, I saw Jacobus cast down his eyes. I banged the plate on the table. At this demonstration of ill humor, he murmured something in an apologetic tone, and I turned on him viciously as if he were accountable to me for these abominable eccentricities, I believe I called them. But I dare say Miss Jacobus here is responsible for most of the offensive manner, I added loftily. She piped out at once in her brazen, ruffinly manner. Yeah. Why don't you leave us in peace, my good fellow? I was astonished that she should dare before Jacobus, yet what could he have done to repress her? He needed her too much. He raised a heavy, drowsy glance for an instant, then looked down again. She insisted with shrill finality. Haven't you done your business, you two? Well, then. She had the true Jacobus impudence, that old woman, her mop of iron-gray hair was parted on the side like a man's, rapishly, and she made as if to plunge her fork into it as she used to do with the knitting needle, but refrained. Her little black eyes sparkled venomously. I turned to my host at the head of the table, menacingly as it were. Well, and what do you say to that, Jacobus? Am I to take it that we have done with each other? I had to wait a little while. The answer, when it came, was rather unexpected and in quite another spirit than the question. I certainly think we might do some business yet with those potatoes of mine, Captain. You will find that. I cut him short. I've told you before that I don't trade. His broad chest heaved without a sound and a noiseless sigh. Think it over, Captain, he murmured, tenacious and tranquil and I burst into a jarring laugh, remembering how he had stuck to the circus rider woman, the depth of passion under that placid surface, which even cuts with a riding whip, so the legend had it, 
could never raffle into the semblance of a storm. Something like the passion of a fish would be if one could imagine such a thing as a passionate fish. That evening I experienced more distinctly than ever the sense of moral discomfort which always attended me in that house lying under the ban of all decent people. I refused to stay on and smoke after dinner, and when I put my hand into the thickly cushioned palm of Jacobus, I said to myself that it would be for the last time under his roof. I pressed his bulky paw heartily nevertheless. Hadn't he got me out of a serious difficulty? To the few words of acknowledgment I was bound, and indeed quite willing to utter, he answered by stretching his closed lips and his melancholy, glued-together smile. That will be all right, I hope, Captain, he breathed out weightily. What do you mean, I asked, alarmed, that your brother might yet? Oh, no, he reassured me. He, he's a man of his word, Captain. My self-communion as I walked away from his door, trying to believe that this was for the last time, was not satisfactory. I was aware myself that I was not sincere in my reflections as to Jacobus's motives, and of course the very next day I went back again. How weak, irrational, and absurd we are. How easily carried away whenever our awakened imagination brings us the irritating hint of a desire. I cared for the girl in a particular way, seduced by the moody expression of her face, by her obstinate silences, her rare scornful words, by the perpetual pout of her closed lips, the black depths of her fixed gaze turned slowly upon me as if in contemptuous provocation, only to be averted next moment with an exasperated indifference. Of course, the news of my assiduity had spread all over the little town. I noticed a change in the manner of my acquaintances, and even something different in the nods of the other captains when meeting them at the landing steps or in the offices where business called me. The old maidish head clerk treated me with distant punctiliousness, and, as it were, gathered his shirts round him for fear of contamination. It seemed to me that the very niggers on the quays turned to look after me as I passed, and as to Jacobus's boatman, his good night, sir, when he put me on board was no longer merely cordial. It had a familiar, confidential sound, as though he had been partners in some villainy. My friend S., the elder, passed me on the other side of the street with a wave of the hand and an ironic smile. The younger brother, the one they had married to an elderly shrew, he, on the strength of an older friendship, and as having paying a debt of gratitude, took the liberty to utter a word of warning. You are doing yourself no good by your choice of friends, my dear chap, he said with infinite gravity. As I knew that the meeting of the brothers Jacobus was the subject of excited comment in the whole of the sugary pearl of the ocean, I wanted to know why I was blamed. I have been the occasion of a move which may end in a reconciliation surely desirable from the point of view of the properties, don't you know? Of course, if that girl were disposed or of it would certainly facilitate, he mused sagely, then, inconsequential creature, gave me a light tap on the lower part of my waistcoat. You old sinner, he cried jovially, much you care for proprieties, but you had better look out for yourself. You know, with a personage like Jacobus, who has no sort of reputation to lose. He had recovered his gravity of a respectable citizen by that time and added regretfully, All the women of our family are perfectly scandalized. But by that time I had given up visiting the S family and the D family. The elder ladies pulled such faces when I showed myself, and the multitude of related young ladies received me with such a variety of looks, wondering, awed, mocking, except Miss Mary, who spoke to me and looked at me with hushed, pained compassion as though I had been ill, that I had no difficulty in giving them all up. 
I would have given up the society of the whole town for the sake of sitting near that girl, snarling and superb, and barely clad in that flimsy, dingy, amber wrapper, open low at the throat. She looked, with the wild wisps of her hair hanging down her tense face, as though she had just jumped out of bed in the panic of a fire. She sat leaning on her elbow, looking at nothing. Why did she stay listening to my absurd chatter? And not only that, but why did she powder her face in preparation for my arrival? It seemed to be her idea of making a toilet, and in her untidy negligence a sign of great effort towards personal adornment. But I might have been mistaken. The powdering might have been her daily practice, and her presence in the veranda a sign of an indifference so complete as to take no account of my existence. Well, it was all one to me. I loved to watch her slow changes of pose, to look at her long immobilities composed in the graceful lines of her body, to observe the mysterious, narrow stare of her splendid black eyes, somewhat longer in shape, half-closed, contemplating the void. She was like a spellbound creature with a forehead of a goddess, crowned by the disheveled, magnificent hair of a gypsy tramp. Even her indifference was seductive. I felt myself growing attached to her by the bond of an irrealizable desire, for I kept my head quite, and I put up with the moral discomfort of Jacobus's sleepy watchfulness, tranquil and yet so expressive, as if there had been a tacit pact between us. I put up with the insolence of the old woman's, aren't you ever going to leave us in peace, my good fellow, with her taunts, with her brazen and sinister scolding. She was of tr the true Jacobus stock, and no mistake. Directly I got away from the girl, I called myself many hard names. What folly was this, I would ask myself. It was like being the slave of some depraved habit. And I returned to her with my head clear, my heart certainly free, not even moved by pity for that castaway. She was as much of a castaway as anyone ever wrecked on a desert island, but as if beguiled by some extraordinary promise. Nothing more unworthy could be imagined. The recollection of that tremulous whisper when I gripped her shoulder with one hand and held a plate of chicken with the other was enough to make me break all my good resolutions. Her insulting taciturnity was enough, sometimes, to make one gnash one's teeth with rage. When she opened her mouth, it was only to be abominably rude in harsh tones to the associate of her reprobate father, and the full approval of her aged relative was conveyed to her by offensive chuckles. If not that, then her remarks, always uttered in the tone of scathing contempt, were of the most appalling inanity. How could it have been otherwise? That plump, ruffianly Jacobus old maid in the tight gray frock had never taught her any manners. Manners, I suppose, are not necessarily for born castaways. No educational establishment could ever be induced to accept her as a pupil, on account of the proprieties, I imagine, and Jacobus had not been able to send her away anywhere. How could he have done it? Who with? Where to? He himself was not enough of an adventurer to think of settling down anywhere else. His passion had tossed him at the tail of a circus up and down strange coasts, but the storm was over. He had drifted back shamelessly, where, social outcast as he was, he remained still a Jacobus, one of the oldest families on the island, older than the French even. There must have been a Jacobus, and at the death of the last dodo, the girl had learned nothing. She had never listened to a general conversation. She knew nothing. She had heard of nothing. She could read, certainly, but all the reading matter that ever came in her way were the newspapers provided for the captain's room of the store. 
Jacob had the habit of taking these sheets home now and then in a very stained and ragged condition. As her mind could not grasp the meaning of any matters treated there except police court reports and accounts of crimes, she had formed for herself a notion of the civilized world as a scene of murders, abductions, burglaries, stabbing affrays, and every sort of desperate violence. England and France, Paris and London, the only two towns of which she seemed to have heard, appeared to her sinks of abomination, reeking with blood, in contrast to her little island where petty larceny was about the standard of current misdeeds, with now and then some more pronounced crime, and that only amongst the imported coolie laborers on sugar estates or the negroes of the town. But in Europe, these things were being done daily by a wicked population of white men, amongst whom, as that ruffianly aristocratic old maid Jacobus pointed out, the wandering sailors, the associates of her precious papa, were the lowest of the low. It was impossible to give her a sense of proportion. I suppose she figured England to herself as about the size of the pearl of the ocean, in which case it would certainly have been reeking with gore and a mere wreck of burgled houses from end to end. One could not make her understand that these horrors on which she fed her imagination were lost in the mass of orderly life like a few drops of blood on the ocean. She directed upon me for a moment the uncomprehending glance of her narrowed eyes, and then would turn her scornful, powdered face away without a word. She would not even take the trouble to shrug her shoulders. At that time, the batches of paper brought by the last mail reported a series of crimes in the East End of London. There was a sensational case of abduction in France, and a fine display of armed robbery in Australia. One afternoon, crossing the dining room, I heard Miss Jacobus piping in the veranda with venomous animosity. I don't know what your precious papa is plotting with that fellow, but he's just the sort of man who's capable of carrying you off far away somewhere and then cutting your throat some day for your money. There was a good half of the length of the veranda between their chairs. I came out and sat down fiercely midway between them. Yes, that's what we do with girls in Europe, I began, in a grimly matter-of-fact tone. I think Miss Jacobus was disconcerted by my sudden appearance. I turned upon her with cold ferocity. As to objectionable old women, they are first strangled quietly, then cut up into small pieces and thrown away, a bit here and a bit there. They vanish. I cannot go so far as to say I had terrified her, but she was troubled by my truculence, the more so because I had been always addressing her with a politeness she did not deserve. Her plump, knitting hands fell slowly on her knees. She said not a word while I fixed her with severe determination. Then as I turned away from her at last, she laid down her work gently and, with noiseless movements, retreated from the veranda. In fact, she vanished. But I was not thinking of her. I was looking at the girl. It was what I was coming for daily, troubled, ashamed, eager, finding in my nearness to her a unique sensation which I indulged with dread, self-contempt, and deep pleasure as if it were a secret vice bound to end in my undoing, like the habit of some drug or other which ruins and degrades its slave. I looked her over from the top of her disheveled head down the lovely line of the shoulder, following the curve of the hip, the draped form of the long limb, right down to her fine ankle below a torn, soiled flounce, and as far as the point of the shabby high-heeled blue slipper dangling from her well-shaped foot, she was moved slightly with quick, nervous jerks, as if impatient of my presence, and in the scent of the massed flowers I seemed to breathe her special and inexplicable charm. 
the heady perfume of the everlasting, irritated captive of the garden. I looked at her rounded chin, the Jacobus chin, and at the full red lips pouting in the powdered sallow face, at the firm modeling of the cheek, the grains of white and the hairs of the straight somber eyebrows, at the long eyes that narrowed gleam of liquid white and intense motionless black, with their gaze so empty of thought and so absorbed in their fixity that she seemed to be staring at her own lonely image in some far-off mirror hidden from my sight amongst the trees. And suddenly, without looking at me, with the appearance of a person speaking to herself, she asked in that voice, slightly harsh, yet mellow, and always irritated, Why do you keep on coming here? Why do I keep on coming here? I repeated, taken by surprise. I could not have told her. I could not even tell myself with sincerity why I was coming there. What's the good of you asking a question like that? Nothing is any good, she observed scornfully to the empty air, her chin propped on her hand, that hand never extended to any man that no one had ever grasped, for I had only grasped her shoulder once, that generous, fine, somewhat masculine hand. I knew well the peculiarly efficient shape, broad at the base, tapering at the fingers, of that hand for which there was nothing in the world to lay hold of. I pretended to be playful. No, but do you really care to know? She shrugged indolently her magnificent shoulders, from which the dingy thin wrapper was slipping a little. Oh, never mind, never mind. There was something smoldering under those airs of lassitude. She exasperated me by the provocation of her nonchalance, by something elusive and defiant in her very form, which I wanted to seize. I said roughly, Why, don't you think I should tell you the truth? Her eyes glided my way for a sidelong look, and she murmured, moving only her full, pouting lips, I think you would not dare. Do you imagine I am afraid of you? What on earth? Well, it's possible, after all, that I don't know exactly why I am coming here. Let us say, with Miss Jacobus, that it is for no good. You seem to believe that outrageous person, the thing she says. If you do have a row with her right now and then, she snapped out viciously. Who else am I to believe? I don't know, I had to own seeing her suddenly very helpless and condemned to moral solitude by the verdict of a respected community. You might believe me, if you choose. She made a slight movement and asked me at once with an effort, as if making an experiment. What is the business between you and Papa? Don't you know the nature of your father's business? Come, he sells provisions to ships. She became rigid again in her crouching pose. Not that. What brings you here, to this house? And suppose it's you. You would not call that business, would you? And now let us drop the subject. It's no use. My ship will be ready for sea the day after tomorrow. She murmured a distinctly scared, so soon, and getting up quickly, went to the little table and poured herself a glass of water. She walked with rapid steps and with indolent swaying of her whole young figure above the hips. When she passed near me, I felt with tenfold force the charm of the peculiar, promising sensation I had formed, the habit to seek near her. I thought with sudden dismay that this was the end of it, that after one more day I would be no longer able to come into this veranda sit on this chair and taste perversely the flavor of contempt in her indolent poses, drink in the provocation of her scornful looks, and listen to the curt, insolent remarks uttered in that harsh and seductive voice, as if my innermost nature had been altered by the action of some moral poison. 
I felt an abject dread of going to sea. I had to exercise a sudden self-control as one puts on a brake to prevent myself jumping up to stride about, shout, gesticulate, make her a scene. For what? What about? I had no idea. It was just the relief of violence that I wanted, and I lolled back in my chair trying to keep my lips formed in a smile, that half-indulgent, half-mocking smile, which was my shield against the shafts of her contempt and the insulting sallies flung at me by the old woman. She drank the water at a draft with the avidity of raging thirst and let herself fall on the nearest chair as if utterly overcome. Her attitude, like certain tones of her voice, had in it something masculine. The knees apart and the ample wrapper, the clasp hands hanging between them, her body leaning forward with drooping head, I stared at the heavy black coil of twisted hair. It was enormous, crowning the head with a crushing and disdained glory. The escaped wisps hung straight down, and suddenly I perceived that the girl was trembling from head to foot, as though that glass of iced water had chilled her to the bone. What's the matter now, I said, startled, but in no very sympathetic mood. She shook her bowed, overweighted head and cried in a stifled voice, but without a rising inflection, Go away, go away, go away. I got up then and approached her with a strange sort of anxiety. I looked down at her round, strong neck, then stooped low enough to peep at her face, and I began to tremble a little myself. What on earth are you gone wild about, miss? Don't care. She flung herself backwards violently, her head going over the back of the chair, and now it was her smooth, full, palpitating throat that lay exposed to my bewildered stare. Her eyes were nearly closed, with only a horrible white gleam under the lids as if she were dead. What has come to you? I asked in awe. What are you terrifying yourself with? She pulled herself together. Her eyes opened frightfully wide now. The tropical afternoon was lengthening the shadows on the hot, weary earth and the abode of obscure desires, of extravagant hopes, of unimaginable terrors. Never mind, don't care. Then, after a gasp, she spoke with such frightful rapidity that I could hardly make out the amazing words. For if you were to shut me up in an empty place as smooth all round as the palm of my hand, I could always strangle myself with my hair. For a moment, doubting my ears, I let this inconceivable declaration sink into me. It is ever impossible to guess at the wild thoughts that pass through the heads of our fellow creatures. What monstrous imaginings of violence could have dwelt under the low forehead of that girl who had been taught to regard her father as capable of anything, more in the light of a misfortune than that of a disgrace, as evidently something to be resented and feared rather than to be ashamed of? She seemed indeed as unaware of shame as of anything else in the world, but in her ignorance her resentment and fear took a childish and violent shape. Of course she spoke without knowing the value of words. What could she know of death, she who knew nothing of life? It was merely as the proof of her being beside herself with some odious apprehension that this extraordinary speech had moved me, not to pity, but to a fascinated, horrified wonder. I had no idea what notion she had of her danger, some sort of abduction. It was quite possible with the talk of that atrocious old woman. Perhaps she thought she could be carried off, bound hand and foot, and even gagged. 
At that surmise, I felt as if the door of a furnace had been opened in front of me. Upon my honor, I cried, you shall end by going crazy if you listen to that abominable old haunt of yours. I studied her haggard expression, her trembling lips, her cheeks even seemed sunk a little, but how I, the associate of her disreputable father, the lowest of the low from the criminal Europe, could manage to reassure her, I had no conception. She was exasperating. Heavens and earth, what do you think I can do? I don't know. Her chin certainly trembled, and she was looking at me with extreme attention. I made a step nearer to her chair. I shall do nothing. I promise you that. We'll do nothing. Do you understand? I shall do nothing whatever of any kind, and the day after tomorrow I shall be gone. What else could I have said? She seemed to drink in my words with the thirsty avidity with which she had emptied the glass of water. She whispered tremulously in that touching tone I had heard once before on her lips, and which thrilled me again with the same emotion. I would believe you, but what about Papa? He be hanged. My emotion betrayed itself by the brutality of my tone. I've had enough of your Papa. Are you so stupid as to imagine that I am frightened of him? He can't make me do anything. All that sounded feeble to me in the face of her ignorance, but I must conclude that the accent of sincerity has, as some people say, a really irresistible power. The effect was far beyond my hopes, and even beyond my conception. To watch the change in the girl was like watching a miracle. The gradual but swift relaxation of her tense glance, of her stiffened muscles, of every fiber of her body, that black, fixed stare into which I had read a tragic meaning more than once, in which I had found a somber seduction, was perfectly empty now, void of all consciousness, whatever and not even aware any longer of my presence, it had become a little sleepy in the Jacobus fashion. But, man being a perverse animal, instead of rejoicing at my complete success, I beheld it with astounded and indignant eyes. There was something cynical in that unconcealed alteration, the true Jacobus shamelessness, I felt as though I had been cheated in some rather complicated deal into which I had entered against my better judgment. Yes, cheated without any regard for, at least, the forms of decency. With an easy indolent and, in its indolence, supple feline movement, she rose from the chair, so provokingly ignoring me now that for very rage I held my ground within less than a foot of her, leisurely and tranquil, behaving right before me with the ease of a person alone in a room. She extended her beautiful arms with her hands clenched, her body swaying, her head thrown back a little, reveling contemptuously in a sense of relief, easing her limbs in freedom after all these days of crouching, motionless poses when she had been so furious and so afraid. All this with supreme indifference, incredible, offensive, exasperating, like ingratitude doubled with treachery. I ought to have been flattered, perhaps, but on the contrary, my anger grew, her movement to pass by me as if I were a wooden post or a piece of furniture that unconcerned movement brought it to a head. I won't say I did not know what I was doing, but certainly cool reflection had nothing to do with the circumstances that next moment both my arms were around her waist. It was an impulsive action, as one snatches at something falling or escaping, and it had no hypocritical gentleness about it either. She had no time to make a sound. 
and the first kiss I planted on her closed lips was vicious enough to have been a bite. She did not resist, and of course I did not stop at one. She let me go on, not as if she were inanimate. I felt her there, close against me, young, full of vigor, of life, a strong, desirable creature, but as if she did not care in the least, in the absolute assurance of her safety, what I did or left undone. Our faces brought close together in the storm of haphazard caresses. Her big, black, wide-open eyes looked into mine, without the girl appearing either angry or pleased or moved in any way. In that steady gaze, which she seemed impersonally to watch my madness, I could detect a slight surprise, perhaps, nothing more. I showered kisses upon her face, and there did not seem to be any reason why this should not go on forever. That thought flashed through my head, and I was on the point of desisting when all at once she began to struggle with a sudden violence which all but freed her instantly, which revived my exasperation with her, indeed a fierce desire never to let her go any more. I tightened my embrace in time, gasping out, No, you don't, as if she were my mortal enemy. On her part, not a word was said. Putting her hands against my chest, she pushed with all her might without succeeding to break the circle of my arms, except that she seemed thoroughly awake now. Her eyes gave me no clue whatever. To meet her black stare was like looking into a deep well, and I was totally unprepared for her change of tactics. Instead of trying to tear my hands apart, she flung herself upon my breast, and with a downward undulating serpentine motion, a quick sliding dive, she got away from me smoothly. It was all very swift. I saw her pick up the tail of her wrapper and run from the door and run for the door at the end of the veranda, not very gracefully. She appeared to be limping a little, and then she vanished. The door swung behind her so noiselessly that I could not believe it was completely closed. I had a distinct suspicion of her black eye being at the crack to watch what I would do. I could not make up my mind whether to shake my fist in that direction or blow a kiss.